Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's seminar. Um, we're going to be talking about navigating privilege, conflict strategies for in-house counsel. So my name is Rebecca Wood and I'm the practice group leader of our disputes team here at Legal Vision and I'm joined by my colleague Julia who's a senior lawyer in my team. Before we jump into the main content we're going to just cover a couple of quick housekeeping items before we begin. So firstly you're going to receive a, a copy of this recording and the slides um, via email after the after the webinar is concluded so don't have to worry about scribbling down notes. Um, we're going to have some Q&A uh, later um, this morning, so please submit your questions in the chat box function and we'll get to them um, at the conclusion of the main content. Finally, we'd like to know how we've done, so please complete the feedback survey after the webinar. Now, if you'd like to know a little bit more about Legal Vision and how we work with um, enterprise clients, please book in a call with our enterprise team. To do that, you just need to leave your contact details in the survey at the end of the webinar and our team will reach out to you. So what are we going to be covering today? So firstly, what is legal professional privilege? How does it apply to in-house counsel? how to ensure that you're acting sufficiently independently. We're going to give you some practical tips, talk about managing conflicts, and then we wanna hear from you and address your questions. So let's just get started. Now I'm going to start with a refresher of what is legal professional privilege. So legal professional privilege shields communications from mandatory disclosure. Why is it important? Well, it encourages our clients um, to have open communication with their legal advisors and is so necessary to achieving justice. So legal professional privilege or LPP encompasses two main types of privilege. There's advice litigation, sorry, advice privilege. So this is the privilege that attracts to confidential communications made for the purposes of legal advice, and litigation privilege. So this safeguards communication and documents which are intend, intended for legal proceedings. So in Australia, LPP um, is addressed differently in, in the jurisdictions. So some of the jurisdictions follow the uniform evidence legislation. So that covers Australian Capital Territory at the Commonwealth level, um, New South Wales, Northern Territory, Tasmania and Victoria, but other states rely simply on the common law. So that's Queensland, South Australia and Western Australia. At the Commonwealth level, we have the Evidence Act that outlines the key elements of LPP. So firstly, there has to be a client-lawyer relationship. The second key element is that there needs to be a confidential um, element to the communications or documents. And thirdly, the documents or communications need to be for the dominant purpose of legal advice or litigation support. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. So to establish a claim for legal, advi legal advice in terms of um, the providing documentary advice for um, you know, whether or not there's you know, getting, some, getting some general advice, to establish a claim for LPP, the purpose of the document needs to be for the dominant purpose of provision of legal advice. The purpose, um, and, and it has to be very clear that there's a, a lawyer-client um, relationship, again, and there's that element of confidentiality. Similarly with the litigation privilege, um, litigation needs to be pending or in, in contemplation. So it needs to be likely or reasonably probable, probable that there's going to be some form of litigation. So claiming um, there needs to be, you know, you can't just provide advice on the off chance that you might get sued one day. There has to be a reasonable expectation that down the track litigation is going to eventuate. It's important to note that the burden of proving that something is protected by legal professional privilege um, rests with the party that's claiming that privilege. So you need to be make sure that if you want to claim privilege over a document that you're going to be able to satisfy those three key elements. The Sydney Airport case is one of the leading cases that um, discusses the dominant purpose test. Now, why is this important for in-house legal counsel? Well, often legal counsel have a dual role, and Julie is going to talk a little bit more about that um, 
next next but but essentially you need to make sure that the communications or the advice that you're giving is the dominant purpose of that communication to uh, to ensure that it's protected by privilege so talking about the Sydney Airport case very briefly this con this case concerned um, in-house legal counsel where a report was commissioned on an accident at Sydney Airport. Now, privilege was claimed over the report on the basis that it was prepared for the dominant purpose of litigation. But when we look, when looking at the report, um, there was four purposes that it were assigned to the report. So firstly, to identify the cause of the incident, um, to show the circumstances in order to allay concerns of the regulator, um, to make recommendations to to avoid um, a future accident. And then a claim for LPP um, you know, was asserted to say that essentially that the, the report was prepared, tabled for the dominant purpose of legal advice. But the court held that it had to be the most important single factor. So where there are multiple purposes for a report, um, privilege is not going to attract to that document unless the, the provision of legal advice is the standout dominant factor. Finally, before I hand over to Julia, I'm going to just confirm that, look, privilege is neither lost or excluded because in-house lawyers um, are providing that advice. So certainly um, privilege can attach to communications prepared in-house. Um, so Julia is going to talk a little bit more about when LPP applies to the work that is carried out in the in-house environment. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Rebecca. So in-house legal counsel or lawyers uh, have a very unique uh, situation where they have both legal and non-legal roles regularly. So for example, sometimes legal counsel in-house can act also as legal counsel and as an officer of the company. So things like a secretary or a director of the company. For this reason, understanding when legal professional privilege applies is, is very important to understand. Um, in addition to the main principles that Rebecca already mentioned. So for in-house lawyers, LPP will only apply to work performed if uh, those lawyers are acting in their capacity as legal advisors or in their legal capacity and not in some non-legal commercial or executive or managerial capacity. Uh, and secondly, in some cases um, where they are sufficiently independent from the organisation, that is that they're truly acting as an independent legal advisor. So as the clients of in-house legal counsel are also their employers, uh, courts have tended to be a bit more cautious in upholding claims for legal professional privilege. And for example, this is because it's in, in many situations, it's much more difficult for an in-house counsel to satisfy uh, the or, or establish the dominant purpose test if they have a number of duties that also includes giving commercial advice. So practically speaking, it's an objective assessment, a question of fact as to um, what the situation is. And generally there is a heavier onus on the party seeking to rely on the privilege as well. So as a quick example, uh, the case of Aquila Coal, PTY Limited and Bowen Central Coal um, from the Queensland Supreme Court it is a very important decision about how the privilege applies to in-house legal counsel. So in that case, the plaintiff, Aquila Cole, uh, sued Bowen Central in regards to an alleged breach, breach of a mining joint venture arrangement between them. Uh, and in that case, uh, the defendant, so Bowen Central, claimed um, LPP over 13 documents. And those documents contained communications to or from the defendant's in-house counsel team. Um, interestingly, this team was headed by a lawyer who was not admitted to legal practice in Australia, but was, was admitted overseas. Um, so the judge in this case accepted that the, defend, the defendant's in-house legal team acted in their capacity as legal advisors, and that they were also independent without any personal loyalties, duties, or interests that might influence their professional legal advice. Um, and on that basis, he's on a rule that all but one of the 13 documents uh, in question actually attracted LPP. So really the question or the significant consideration for the court in that matter um, was whether or not the documents uh, or the communications were substantially commercial or advisory in nature. Um, so the mere fact that the in-house legal team dealt with issues from a commercial perspective as well uh, was insufficient to set aside a claim for LPP 
Um, and again, the court looked at the dominant purpose test as well in that situation. Now, the next sort of important factor that I wanted to touch on slightly here is uh, the second element there that I mentioned of acting or ensuring that legal counsel is acting sufficiently independently. Now, there has been some case law around this, um, and generally speaking, the main precedent um, for this is the case of Rich and Harrington. So there is a suggestion in, in many cases like that one that there is a separate legal requirement for in-house counsel to be sufficient, sufficiently independent. And what that has been found to mean is that um, the lawyers are independent so that their personal loyalties, duties or interests don't influence their professional advice. Um, so in the matter of Rich and Harrington, uh, legal advice was provided by to an internal legal by the Internal Legal Department of PwC um, in relation to a claim of sexual discrimination and harassment by a female partner against the firm and other partners as well. And notwithstanding significant evidence that was given in that matter about the separation of the legal department, uh, the court found that there was no privilege that arose because the head of the legal department was also a partner of PwC and therefore a potential respondent as well. Um, so the personal nature of the allegations were so inherently likely to engage the personal loyalties, duties and interests of all of the partners at PwC, including the head of legal, that um, the advice did not have that objectively independent or sufficiently independent character necessary to support that claim of legal professional privilege. Um, so that just reminds us that, you know, the lawyer, and it has been found in cases that the lawyer must be independent um, in, in that case. And this line of authority also created a bit of concern around the extent to which privilege attached to the work of in-house le uh, legal counsel, in-house lawyers, who also hold those non-legal or commercial roles, and the need to prove that independence in the event of a challenge to privilege claims. Now, more recently, uh, the courts have moved away from independence being a separate requirement for in-house lawyers, and they've now focused instead on purpose and capacity. So the purpose and capacity in which the lawyers were acting. Uh, so for example, um, in the matter of Archer Capital 4A, uh, as trustee for the Archer Capital Trust and Sage Group in 2013, um, it was found that there is no real separate requirement for independence in the case of privilege claims, where the relevant lawyer is an employed in-house lawyer. But the better view is that the requirement of independence is part uh, and parcel or an aspect of the in-house lawyer's relationship between them and their client and the capacity in which they're providing that advice. Um, so the fact that an in-house counsel might have a managerial, administrative or finance function doesn't really dilute the privilege that attract, attracts to those communications, but it's important to consider it in part and parcel with um, the capacity in which that advice is provided. And the capacity is important to remember that it's about the point in time that those confidential communications come into existence as well. So similarly, um, in the case of Martin and Norton Rose Fulbright in 2019, the federal court also rejected the approach in Rich um, that there's a separate requirement for sufficient independence, but again said uh, that it's a criterion uh, in the court's consideration of whether someone is acting in their capacity as a lawyer or in some other capacity, um, and that therefore in, the, uh, in, in and of itself impacts the determination of the dominant purpose of the communication as well. Um, but with all of this said, it does remain prudent for in-house lawyers to take steps which, in the event of any challenge um, to privilege claims, demonstrates or allows the court to infer that you are or they are sufficiently independent. Um, and Rebecca will now deal with some of those tips that you can consider in, in doing so. Thanks, Julia. And look, certainly picking up on that last point that you made, um, our you know, because it because in-house lawyers do face greater challenges in making claims for LPP compared to external lawyers. Um, you know, generally in-house lawyers should take proactive steps to identify and maintain privilege over documents and communications that they issue. Um, so one practical tip is that in-house lawyers should educate their colleagues on the importance of privilege and distinguishing legal advice from commercial advice. 
Um, it's important to, to know that just merely marking a document as privileged is not going to guarantee that a privileged claim can be made. So again, thinking about that Sydney Airport case that we discussed, um, it's, it's important to make sure that the dominant purpose of that document it is actually legal advice. Um, so consider perhaps separ separating out legal advice um, from an, a document that also comprises commercial advice. Being copied in on communications doesn't necessarily mean that legal professional privilege is going to attach to those internal communications. Um, so make sure that you clearly label communications um, that are subject to legal professional privilege or for the purpose of providing legal advice, that's um, often helpful. Um, another top tip would be to mark your documents confidential and subject to legal professional privilege. Don't forward without discussion of with and, and insert your name. Um, and that can help um, prevent inadvertent waiver. So some other top tips, um, identifying your client. So whether it's an individual or a specific business unit within your organisation, um, make sure that the documents that you're preparing make it clear that there's a client-lawyer relationship um, and the purpose of the document is to provide legal advice. Separate legal and commercial advice from documents. So you might want to annex the legal advice to a commercial report. Um, use those labels that we discussed. Um, make sure that you're maintaining independence um, in your actions and decisions. Consider outsourcing complex legal advice or engaging with external experts to ensure that independence um, and there's a clarity of purpose. Make sure that you maintain your practising certificate to demonstrate that you're performing legal duties, although it is possible for in-house counsel to still claim privilege over documents when they don't have a practising certificate. Clearly indicate when non-lawyers are acting under, the, under your instructions to avoid confusion as to whether or not there's a dominant purpose of legal advice in their actions. Be mindful of who receives privileged documents and communications and make sure that there's policies in place against circulation to other parties to prevent waiver. Um, again, minimise the distribution of communications um, think about who are the key stakeholders that need to receive this information. Um, have a meeting to discuss who's going to receive communication and put those policies in place. Now, we're going to talk about managing conflicts. Handing over to you to Julia to get that started. Thank you. So, look, another very important aspect of the in-house legal role, um, apart from considering legal professional privilege, is also managing how conflicts arise. Um, and it's important to remember that the same ethical rules apply to in-house lawyers that apply also to external lawyers. Um, so by way of a quick reminder, uh, some of the essential rules that are found in the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules include first and foremost, the paramount duty to the court and the administration of justice, um, the duty to act in the best interest of a client, the duty to be honest and courteous in all dealings in the course of legal practice, to deliver legal services competently, diligently as a, and as promptly as reasonably possible, to avoid any compromise to your integrity and your professional independence, uh, to comply with the rules and also with the law generally, to follow a client's lawful, proper and competent instructions and to maintain confidentiality. Now, these rules exist not only in, in solicitor's conduct rules, but also as fiduciary duties at, at, at law as well. Um, as an aside as well, very much so, especially where in-house legal counsel have that dual managerial role as well. Um, it's important to remember that um, there is also a duty for company officers to protect the company from legal risk. And it has been found that that duty exists. And this is something that we recommended you know, all in-house uh, legal counsel consider when they are in that dual role. We won't be discussing it in much detail here, but it's definitely something that comes up quite often um, in, in case law as well. So moving forward, we're going to talk through a couple of uh, scenarios or conflict scenarios that are found to regularly come up um, for in-house legal counsel through the performance of their roles. Uh, one of those is where there are internal requests for personal legal advice. 
So sometimes managers and employees of the company try to seek legal advice about their personal affairs or even their roles and actions within the company itself. So for example, a senior manager might ask for legal advice on the terms of their employment relationship with the company. So when you're responding to requests like that, um, it's very important to make clear that you act on behalf of the company as an entity and you can only give legal advice with respect to the company's matters and not personal matters for, for those employees. Um, but again, it's always nice to you know, politely uh, direct them to seek independent legal advice about their own position and personal affairs. Um, and, and we do note that you know, when you are dealing with these people day to day, there's obviously an emotional element involved in you know, trying to help them out. But it's important to delineate um, who your real client actually is, but still provide some guidance about where they can go to get that advice. Uh, another scenario, a complex scenario that does come up as well is where there are competing interests within the business. And this can also be a commercial as well as a legal conflict. Uh, so for example, where there are different sections of a company that have internal competing commercial and compliance interests, they might seek legal adv advice uh, from an in-house counsel on the same issue. So for instance, sales and marketing people might want to launch a new product and market it as quickly as possible so they can get as much market share as they can. However, in the same vein, the quality assurance team um, might wish to conduct further health and safety tests before doing so. If you're requested for advice from, from both of those teams and aware of those competing priorities, it might require you to investigate this further and potentially escalate the ultimate decision further up the organisation's hierarchy. Um, and underlying, I guess, a conflict like this is to remember that, to remember those, those standard or those general and essential ethical rules, the main one of which in this situation would be that you must act in the best interest of your client in any matter in which you represent them. So it's important to remember that if there are these competing interests, it will be uh, generally difficult for you to act in the best interest. So it sometimes is good to, to go up further up the chain to the relevant decision maker that can that can provide that decision. Okay, um, I think I will turn to Rebecca now to discuss a couple of other conflict scenarios as well. Certainly, thanks Julia. So look, there can be a conflict that can arise between the company and your own personal interests. And so in-house lawyers need to be aware of sensitive information such as a corporate restructure that might impact upon your job. Well, if you know, um, this might actually mean that you've got a personal conflict, particularly if this restructure is, is going to impact you personally. So the best practice would be to advise your employer of a conflict of interest. Um, and remember that Rule 12.1 of the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, a solicitor must not act for a client where there's a conflict of duty to serve the best interests of the client and the interests of the solicitor. Another scenario where this might pop up is if you've actually drafted a, a contract um, and there's actually a dispute in relation to, the, to that contract. Um, you might want to consider getting some external advice because you not, might not be personally in, sufficiently independent to, to give the advice on, on, on a document that you've drafted. Um, conflicts with external law firms. So if you are um, referring work out to external law firms, it's always prudent to ensure that that law firm doesn't have any conflicts. Um, and, and making yourself um, feel comfortable that, that that no conflict has will arise with from the provision of that legal advice. Finally, ethical conflicts. There may be situations where there's a conflict between the duty to, of your duty to the court and your duty to your employer. So this might arise where, for example, um, your client wants to do something that might not be legal. Um, you need to remember that your ethical duties are to the court. Um, and you, need, you might need to notify your employer, be clear and forthright about your advice of the legal consequences of non-compliance with the law. Um, take it further if people aren't ignoring, are ignoring your advice and, and just remember that if there's any complaints that you know that you need to make sure that you're complying with your ethical obligations. So, we're just going to do a quick summary of what we've talked about today and then we're going to jump into some of your questions. So Julia's just handing over to you just to run through a few of our key takeaways.
Yeah, sure. So the three key takeaways we'd like you to, to take away from this discussion today is firstly to understand the essential elements of legal professional privilege generally and those additional considerations that apply to in-house lawyers specifically. Um, so things like making sure there is a client lawyer relationship, uh, making sure that the communication has a confidential nature, um, making sure that it is created for the dominant purpose of providing or receiving legal advice um, or for use in, in actual or anticipated litigation, but also making sure that when you are acting in your capacity, you're acting so in your legal capacity only and that you're sufficiently independent in your role as a legal advisor from the, your co the company or your, your employer. Number two is to remember to put in place mechanisms to make your life easier in your internal department or in the and in the organisation generally to assist in uh, maintaining LPP and educating other people in, in why it's so important. Um, these can be things like static and continuing sort of tasks or mechanisms. Um, so one, for example, would be putting into place the policy documents that Rebecca touched upon and even implementing ongoing training internally and externally about how to deal with these issues and also how other people can instruct you as legal counsel within the organisation. And thirdly is remembering your fiduciary and statutory ethical obligations as a lawyer when dealing with conflicts. Uh, there are, of course, scenarios in which it can be quite complex and the answer isn't as easy as it seems. In those situations, you can certainly seek legal advice um, externally or you might get in touch with the Ethics Division of the Law Society that can also assist um, in discussing those issues. So that concludes the main part of our webinar. Um, we'd also like to bring to your attention, um, we have a guide uh, to resolving business disputes that you can download in the handout panel or by scanning the QR code. That might be useful. Uh, you might also be interested in an upcoming event that we have on the WHS Legal Update Essentials for In-House Counsel and Business Managers. That's on the 29th of February at 11am and you can register using the URL on the screen. So we're going to answer your questions shortly. And while you submit the remainder of them, uh, we'd just like to take a minute to tell you about Legal Vision's desk extension. So having spoken to hundreds of C-suite and in-house counsel, uh, we understand that in-house lawyers are increasingly being pulled in, in many directions. They're required to provide input on business critical matters and strategic matters at an executive level, while also managing a high volume of business as usual matters as well. And of course, all of this is managed within a very tight budget and an even tighter labour market. So under Legal Vision's desk extension, uh, we can assist you with all of your business as usual legal needs, allowing you to more cost effectively increase uh, the bench depth and the capability of your team and to prioritise the business critical matters. So our desk extension lawyers invest upfront in understanding what's important to your business and to work as an extension of your in-house legal department. So if you'd like to learn more about how Legal Vision's desk extension can help you, uh, you can provide your details when the survey appears at the end of the webinar and someone can get in touch with you to discuss further. So now we're going to answer some of your questions and I might shoot back to Rebecca to, to go through some of those. Great. Great. Thanks, Julia. So our first question is, suppose a matter has been earmarked as privileged and confidential by an in-house counsel and two or more lawyers engage in email correspondence in relation to that matter when responding to the lawyer's query request. Are those communications, if those communications are marked privileged and confidential, are they covered by LPP? So um, as we discussed earlier, just merely marking something as privileged and confidential doesn't mean it's necessarily privileged. Um, to attract privilege, the communication needs to be made uh, either to or, or from the lawyer in their pro professional capacity um, acting as a lawyer. Um, so generally, if the communication doesn't involve the lawyer, it might not attract the protection of um, LPP. But there are cases where those documents might actually be protected. So as long as the dominant purpose test is met, um, that privilege may extend to those documents. So it really depends on the content of, um, of, of what's being discussed. If they're collating information for the purpose of, of providing that to you to obtain legal, legal advice, then there's certainly an argument that that could be um, protected by privilege. 
Unfortunately, it's not a, it's you know it's not that clear cut, so it would really depend on the content of the, of the communications. Um, we've got another question, interesting question here. How does cross-border privilege work? Does my LPP status in Australia cover a dispute in the US? Okay, so generally the position is um, in that courts and regulatories, uh, regulatory authorities apply uh, apply the law in the forum where the where we're dealing with the question of LPP. So um, from an AU perspective, the law of the forum. So the law of the Forum of Australia permits privilege to attach to your foreign legal advice provided for the dominant purpose um, test. But if you're providing um, advice, say to the US, um, and there's a claim for privilege, because the person that wants to claim the privilege is based in the US, um, you might need to get some advice as to the requirements to claim privilege um, from a US-based attorney. Um, but that's a very good question. Julia, um, I might hand over this next question to you. Um, do you need to caveat internal communications with a statement indicating that they're subject to legal professional privilege? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. And like we discussed in, in the webinar, it's not strictly required to caveat or to label your communication uh, as subject to LPP. Um, essentially, whether or not it's subject to LPP, it's a factual matter and depends on all of the circumstances, including the dominant purpose. However, it's certainly best practice to do so. Um, it can also assist in identifying privileged or potentially privileged communications if you were required to produce them. Um, what it can also do, or what labelling uh, or including caveats can also do, like Rebecca mentioned, is uh, you can indicate to people that they shouldn't, you can indicate on the actual document of communication that it shouldn't be circulated without your consent or without speaking with you first. And what this can assist you to do practically is make sure that uh, privilege isn't waived uh, unintentionally as well by providing it to, to people that aren't supposed to have access to that document. Okay. Um, I've got a question here about um, whether or not the instruction of a litigation manager who's a non-lawyer attracts legal professional privilege um, if it is conveyed directly to a practitioner. So again, the first thing to remember is the existence of a lawyer-client relationship. So LPP will cover communications um, if their dominant purpose is for either obtaining or receiving or giving legal advice. So if the litigation manager um, is providing you with instructions, then then yes, we would say that that communication um, could be covered by legal professional privilege. Um, I've got a, um, a good question here about conflicts. So I might cover this one. So if the company does not take your advice and proposes to do something unethical, what as an in-house lawyer should you do in this scenario, even if you've, if you've escalated this, should you resign? Um, it's a good question. Um, you know, ultimately, we need to remember our um, professional obligations, um, as we outlined earlier. If this was me, I'd be providing a written advice um, to say that you don't recommend the steps that they're um, preparing to undertake, um, that you, you know, that you cannot assist them further, that, that, that the action is being taken contrary to your recommendations, um, that you have obligations um, to the court that will mean that you can no longer provide any further advice or assistance. As to whether or not you should resign, well, that you know that's obviously a very personal matter. I think before you get to that point, I'd be reaching out to the um, Law Society Ethics Line to get some a bit more advice as to what's going on. But if that's happened to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, let's have a look. Are there any circumstances that can undermine privilege existing? Julia, I might throw this one over to you if that's okay. Yeah, of course. So yes, there are certainly circumstances in which um, that can undermine existing privilege or waiver as we know uh, the term to be. We don't specifically touch on that in this webinar and, and there is such broad depth of case law and specific scenarios that it could be subject to its very own webinar. But just broadly speaking, um, waiver of legal professional privilege can occur when someone or the holder of the privilege or someone acting on their behalf 
the holder of the privilege being the client, uh, acts in a way that's inconsistent with the communication remaining confidential. Um, now, this can happen intentionally, unintentionally, um, uh, or it can be implied as well in various scenarios. So more often than not, it happens unintentionally or impliedly. Um, so by accident, if certain documents are, are produced, uh, for example, by way of subpoena or to a third party that shouldn't have been produced, that can happen. There are obviously mechanisms that, or things that you can do to try and minimise that or try and negate that, which is make sure that you reach out to the person that you disclose that information to, uh, ask them to retract it and do everything else in your power to make sure that they no longer have access to it or haven't even opened it as well. Um, importantly, obviously, documenting the steps that you've taken might assist in trying to to, to rebut any waiver argument as well. Um, but interestingly as well, the one that comes up quite a lot in case law is the implied waiver. Um, so where you, where you disclose potentially the gist or someone discloses the gist of a legal advice or the substance of the legal advice. Um, so that can happen, for example, and there have been cases where, you know, a board's lawyers have been, uh, there was a statement made that the board's lawyers have been instructed to vigorously defend a claim and they were advised that the plaintiff's claim won't succeed. Um, so that is, uh, in cases, has been found to be, um, you know, providing or, or disclosing the conclusion of the advice and does have the risk of waiving not just that conclusion but the entirety of the legal advice and documents pertaining to it. So if you do come into a situation where you are worried that there might have been a waiver or, or unintentional disclosure, uh, of, of advice and that might not necessarily be on your behalf but it might be something your client or one of their employees has inadvertently done. Um, it's important to, to try and deal with that issue as soon as possible. Like I said, you might be able to remedy it by taking steps to, to you know, act promptly and take steps to remove that from circulation or make sure that no one has read that. Um, or, or put steps in place as well to, to manage that internally. But I think, again, with the waiver type of scenarios, it's probably an important point to, um, to be subject to ongoing training, um, not just for you know, legal, the legal team, but also the broader team within the organisation and the people that actually use the legal advice. Okay, thanks, Julia. I've had a couple of questions about um, ESOPs. Um, one question here is, is there a potential conflict between an in-house lawyer providing advice on an employee share option plan when they are currently receiving stock options under the company's ESOP plan? So look, I, would, I, I think that there is a potential for conflict there um, because you're personally involved. So as we kind of discussed earlier, if, you know, we need to think about um, the, the legal professional rules and when there's a, a potential for conflict, a personal conflict and, and one that and the client then you know you should probably sit this one out um, you know what you might want to do if, if that were to happen um, is to suggest that that is actually um, referred out to some external lawyers to deal with um, another another good conflict question here and actually one that you know we we even is um, as external lawyers have to deal with quite often. If two executive directors ask for advice when they're in a dispute, who do you advise and, and what do you do? So yeah, look, this is a scenario that we deal with on, on, a, on a daily basis when we get client company clients asking for advice in relation to um, you know, a dispute between directors and shareholders. You know, it can be really complex as to understand well, what can you do in that situation. Um, in, in that situation, you've just got to remember that who is your client? Your client, your client is the company, um, and it may be that if those executive directors are looking to exercise um, rights, you know, in relation to breaches of directors' duties, um, they might be actions that they need to take themselves in their personal capacity. Um, I would be recommending that um, you suggest that you can't um, act. Due to, to, due to the fact that your client is the company and you can't really just withhold advice that you're giving to one party and, and not to the other. And so suggesting very gently um, that they might be best served by getting their own independent advice um, outside of the organisation is something that I would be recommending. 
Um, a question here and for Julia, I might throw this one over to you. Can LPP be waived or lost if the internal legal advice is circulated widely within the organisation, but not outside of the organisation? Yeah, look, in that situation, I would say that while it's still remaining in the realms of the organisation, the organisation being your client, it's unlikely that you'll be waiving legal professional privilege. The waiver usually occurs when you're disclosing um, that privileged advice or communication to a third party. Uh, and that's when that can usually arise. So I would say in that situation, it's it's probably unlikely. But like Rebecca mentioned before in the webinar, it's always good to make sure that legal advice is only circulated to the people it needs to go to. Um, and, and that's including the gist and the conclusion of the legal advice, because um, it's very hard to control what an entire group of people will do with that advice. Uh, and unfortunately, if they are to disclose it to a third party, it might have uh, the consequence of, of waiving privilege. Yeah, and, and certainly, um, you know, like we were saying earlier, making sure that you're, when you're giving advice, you know, you're taking steps to try and limit that dissemination because, you know, communicating with the cast of thousands can, can cause problems and you can't control um, an email once it's been sent out. So it could be that the privilege might be waived over certain communications, depending on the nature of, of the emails between different staff members. Um, another question here, how do we navigate LPP across employment matters involving serious misconduct and suspension or termination of employment? Um, look, again, I, I think that this can be dealt with, you know, with the general principles that we've discussed. So um, if you've been engaged, to provide legal advice as to whether or not um, there has been um, an event that should be considered serious misconduct. Making sure that um, if you're documenting the advice that you're making it very clear that that's the purpose of the communication. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, if you, you know, for abundant caution, consider um, external uh, counsel. We're nearly out of time, but we've got so many, so many good questions that are coming in. Um, let me let me just um, throw, I'll just read this one. Are you conflicted to act if a, if the company requested legal advice on a certain matter and a senior exec separately sought advice on the same topic but had different reasons or agenda for seeking such advice? Um, Again, I, it, that's a very specific question. I'm more than happy to have a chat about this after the um, after the seminar. But if you've been um, requested to provide some legal advice on a certain issue, and um, and a senior executive then goes and gets their own independent legal advice, I can't see that there's a, a conflict. Um, as long as you know, you've, if you've been instructed to do something and then you've performed that obligation. Um, I think whether or not the senior executive ha has gone and got their own legal advice, um, you know, I, I don't think it really impacts upon upon your on your um, ethical obligations. But um, if there's a little bit more to that scenario, more than happy to have a chat about it. Okay, so look, it looks like we're, we're fast running out of time. Um, and if we haven't got to your question, I'm I'm so sorry, but please um, take the advantage of, of a complimentary consultation because we'd love to address your, your questions um, and to make sure that, you know, you've got value out of this seminar, more than happy to address them. So look, I'll, I think we've got time for, for one more. So let me just, um, let me just go through and find something very interesting and juicy that, that we might all appreciate. Um, another ESOP one, there's a few ESOP ones there. ESOP. Regarding potential conflicts between different departments and maintaining the company's best interests, how would this be applied where the employer of the Hint House company is the head of several other associated um, entities? So, yeah, 
I can see that, <laughs> yeah, look, that, 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 it, that definitely does have some good scope for, for conflict. So again, coming back to our general principles, it's a, it's a matter of identifying, well, who is your, who is your client? What is the scope of the advice that you've been asked to do? Um, assessing whether or not, um, if there is any conflicts, then you need to make sure that um, you've escalated that. Um, perhaps carving out what you can answer and what you can't answer, and the matters that you can't answer, you know, a polite recommendation might be that you engage external lawyers. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately the, you just need to make it clear that it would be a conflict if you answered, you know, all of these issues and it's in the best interest of the company to ensure that they're getting the right legal advice. So look, we've run out of time. So thank you very much for your time today. Um, again, we'd love to speak to you. So please book in a call um, with our enterprise team to learn a bit more about legal vision. Um, and leave your contact details at the end of the survey if we haven't addressed your question so we can arrange another time to speak. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.